Welcome everyone to this, the evening event associated with our Fauna and Flora International's annual general meeting, 2016. Thank you all very much for coming and for showing your support for FFI and the really important work that we do. Um, I am Jo Elliott. I am Senior Director for Conservation Partnerships at FFI. Um, I have one item of housekeeping before I give you a brief introduction to the evening's talks, and that is could everyone please just check that their mobile phones are off or silenced or whatever other things you would like to do with your mobile phone. Left outside, possibly. <laughs> um, the theme for this evening is working with business to save species. Now, FFI has long, long recognized the need to work with business in all of our conservation work. And that's not in order to uh, seek funding or to see these businesses as donors, it's because we definitely see business as the primary decision makers in the way natural resources and land are used, and in the way that local stakeholders, particularly local communities, are engaged in that decision making. Was that a phone? <laughs> How extraordinary. Okay. Sorry, we won't, we won't, I won't mention it. Um, and it didn't put me off at all. Right. <laughs> So, here we are, FFI working with business. Um, it's, it's been a, a long process of getting to know businesses, figuring out how conservation organizations should work with them. But over the last 20 years, and I'm sure most of you will agree, the imperative for conservation organizations to work with business has only grown. Now, this evening, you're going to be treated to some really interesting examination of the extractive sector and the work that we've been doing with the extractives on species. But FFI works a lot more broadly than mining, uh, oil and gas infrastructure and cement industries. So just to illustrate a couple of recent things that we're really proud of, in addition to the um, forthcoming ban on microplastics that Mark referenced in his talk to the uh, annual general meeting earlier, um, where, which is based on a project that FFI initiated six years ago. Our plastics team started working on awareness building and uh, voluntary removal of microplastics from cosmetics products. And that now is credited as the base from which this movement has pushed the UK government to declaring this imminent ban. And we're very, very proud of that work. Um, in addition to that, a couple of other examples of non-extractive work that we've, we, has has led to some recent conservation gains. Um, a project that we have really been launching over the last few months called Wild Labs is a, uh, an online community of technologists and conservation actors that's been growing very rapidly and that seeks to find new innovative ways to apply new technologies to solve often old conservation problems. And a lot of that is, as you can imagine, tracking, um, and uh, a sort of monitoring data and so on for biodiversity management. Um, and uh, that, that work on Wild Labs has been developed with support from a, a partnership that includes the leading uh, global technology company, Arm. And then another final example is from uh, work that we've been doing in our agriculture supply chains. We've been working there for a long time, but most recently, we have formed a, a partnership with The Body Shop with their responsible sourcing team, looking at how to source ingredients, particularly oils, from uh, critical areas, critical habitat areas that we're working with, but most importantly, in partnership with local communities, aiming for that elusive win of the triple bottom line of social, environmental, and commercial success. And we have high hope for that as well. So for those, who, for those business partners of FFI who are in the audience, and I know there are some, you will know that FFI is no pushover when it comes to working with, with business. We are rigorous, we're quite cautious, and we really do aim to find practical paths towards measurable conservation gains, and at least to make sure there are not conservation losses. Um, so that's the basis on which we will, we will work with, with a business, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that. So uh, on that note, I will turn to the extractive sector, which is the sector we're going to look at this evening. 
as, you, as many of you will be directly familiar with and you, as you will all understand, the extractive industries are the hardest and most challenging for the conservation sector to work with. These guys dig holes, level hills, extract minerals in places that are often vulnerable and hold um, important species and populations we're trying to conserve. So FFI now has quite pretty extensive experience of how to work with these guys and we have some successes. So tonight you're going to be hearing from two senior FFI staff from Pippa Howard, who is uh, FFI Director for Business and Biodiversity, and from Tony Witten, who is our Regional Director for the whole of our Asia-Pacific region, which is our largest region. And after both have spoken, there'll be an opportunity for you guys to ask questions and have your questions answered, we hope. And so do save them up as the presentations uh, are made, and we'll look forward to hearing your thoughts as well. Anyway, I hope you enjoy this evening, and with no further ado, I will invite Pippa to come to the stage. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, Sir David, colleagues and friends, mum and dad, Johnny. <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to take you tonight on a journey into a slightly different realm as a cons conservationist, one that's not always uh, sat so easily in our, uh, for our critics. But it's certainly become more mainstream as the disciplines of bio biodiversity and business mature and as we integrate its vital components into the projects uh, across our, our entire portfolio. Partnerships are the mainstay of FFI's um, approach to conservation, and the potent potential of cross-sectoral collaboration with business is increasingly in, um, needed in our conservation projects across our rapidly changing world. From the early days of the Gentleman's Society and the preservation of the wild fauna across the empire, uh, to the modern people-centric integrated conservation, things have changed rather quite <laughs> radically. <laughs> FFI has been working with business for over 20 years, and in 1999, we coined the phrase business and biodiversity. We hosted the first formal gathering of minds with BP, Rio Tinto, British American Tobacco, and another other couple of other controversial organizations in London to discuss the need to join forces and address the loss of biodiversity. We knew then that business needed to be part of the conservation equation. So business needs to change really the way that they think, the way they make decisions, the way they operate, and this is what we try to do. Working with their sectoral associations, their corporate headquarters, um, all the way down to their remote operations in the four corners of the globe, and working with the banks that fund them, and the critics of civil society who keep that critical eye on them. Now, as part of our innovative and adaptive approach, we've molded a somewhat different kind of conservationist, and we've evolved and adapted to this consumer-driven and disposable world of ours. I've just returned, actually, from the World, um, world Conservation Congress in Hawaii, and the title of that was really um, called A Planet of, uh, at the Crossroads. Now, Congress and the Members' Assembly takes uh, place every four years, and it's where the IUCN's, IUCN's member organizations collectively decide on the actions to address the world's most pressing and often most con controversial conservation and sustainable development challenges. Importantly, the motions such as uh, the no-go to large-scale um, industrial activities um, in protected areas was passed. That's quite a landmark decision, actually, this year. Nearly 10,000 people attended more than 100 sessions at the IUCN Congress were on business, business and biodiversity. And these featured promising examples of business engagement, showcasing the latest knowledge, policies and tools being used by the public and private sectors to transform business practices, demonstrating that business and partnerships play a really key role in the new global Go, uh, to achieve the, the new global goals on sustainable development and climate change. I delivered, personally, back-to-back <laughs> -back sessions over four days, um, so FFI was very much in there. Some of you may have noticed the recent attention given to our relationship with Anglo-American. I recognize John. Hello, John. <laughs> Good old days. 
Um, I worked as a consultant for over a decade, and it was not uncommon for a client to suggest the desi a desired outcome for an impact assessment uh, process or to overstate the likely positive outcomes of mitigation actions associated with predicted negative impacts of a project. In fact, the fundamental failure of that whole impact assessment process is one of the reasons I left consultancy. As an NGO, we ask, answer only to our critics and the moral standpoint that we, have, that, that we are prepared to take on an issue. We have considerable technical competencies that we can use to formulate objective assessments and the evidence base from which we can defend our case. We make these assessments available to our partners, our clients, sometimes they get called, government decision makers and those funding projects, the big lender banks like the World Bank. And it's incumbent upon them to actually use the advice we give wisely. This is where the support of other stakeholders really needed in the decision-making process to ensure due process is taken and the right thing is done. This might mean a no-go alternative, a decision recommended by us or made preemptively by the company or in response to a government authority. What I don't think we can do is to tamper with the evidence nor overly interfere with due process. But we can be strong in whatever our statement is and hold our ground uninfluenced throughout the process. That's what an NGO can do in partnership with business. This means potentially disagreeing with a partner, walking away or even engaging in advocacy if appropriate. Anglo knows this and so trusts not only our technical competencies but also that we won't let them stray off the path. We are too open and honest about where the line in the sand is drawn. This is a far more difficult but more eyes wide open approach for them to take than to get a consultancy to do the job. Through our partnerships they get a watchdog on their back and at the same time we get to make sure that they are heading in the right direction towards global best practice. So that essentially is where we stand. Now Joe requested you to switch off your mobile phones, one or two of you didn't. Do you mind giving me a, a show of hands actually, who owns a mobile phone? Just a show of hands. 100%, I'd say. So this is really good evidence of our dependency on an addiction to natural resources of the mineral variety. It's also a clear indication of the problem of biodiversity loss, and they're as much your responsibility as it is of those working directly in this profession. So to fulfill our insatiable appetites for stuff, we're forcing business and the producers of minerals to actually, and oil-derived products to move into more and more marginal and more extreme environments and more technically challenging places, which explains some of the anomalies of the geographical distribution of our projects. And my team and I have to go where the companies go and they go where the minerals are. This is FFI, a map of FFI's global uh, project coverage and uh, the Business and Biodiversity Programme actually covers pretty much most of the globe, but you may have noticed there's some countries where our programmes, our regional programmes aren't working. So we're taken where the minerals are. Ironically, and very often, unique and rare minerals such as the highly valuable coal tan that is used in our phones are found in unique, unusual and rare geology. And unusual and rare geology creates unusual soils and, which, and in which unusual plants and animals are often found. So there's a huge correlation between biodiverse regions and mineral-rich areas. Not all the projects of the Business and Biodiversity Portfolio match those of our regional pro programs, as I said. But I'm going to take you on a journey this evening just to show you why this kind of conservation is so important and how we've achieved some remarkable gains for biodiversity. So here we go, the title of the talk, From Gorillas to Gastropods. Deep in Central Africa, FFI works with the IGCP, the International Gorilla Conservation Programme, which Sir David started with uh, us and WWF many years ago. And they work on a variety of remarkable projects across a great number of, well, three of the great ape states. The forests inhabited by gorillas are threatened by a number of different pressures, not least of those connected to the exploitation of minerals. FFI wrote a definitive text on the assessment of coltan, which is essential to those mobile phones, as I said, as a conflict mineral. 
and we wrote, um, and the impact, sorry, of this on great ape conservation. We wrote the book, so to speak, on what the implications of, of this was for, for species and what could be done to protect them. Some of these mines are artisanal and are often historically embedded within the culture and livelihoods of local people. We have had to find solutions to the coexistence of these activities with our efforts to protect wildlife in these habitats. Others are the work of multinational corporations who forge massive infrastructure corridors deep into the forest so that they can exploit minerals. The role of FFI in these cases is different and be both technically and advocacy based depending on the nature of the threat and the receptivity of the organizations involved. With Anglo American, for example, we provided our technical expertise and experience to help avoid and minimize impacts for inevitable mines, to develop biodiversity conservation projects and habitat restoration programs, where we designed to reinstatement of forest and enable the return of wildlife to these areas. We have helped to set up indigenous species nurseries, for example, and designed livelihoods for conservation programs. Sometimes, as with the Alaskan Pebble Project, a huge, huge mega project of copper and gold, we've assessed the sensitivity of a project site and given very definitive strategic advice to the company and decided to firmly walk away from any engagement with the project. This is the line of principle I was talking about and which we very proudly defend in the projects that we undertake. We have to be, no, be able to say no. Here, what was at stake with the world was the world's most important sustainable salmon fishery, and the proposed mine was to, be, was to be built at the headwaters of three rivers that not only fed the Great Bristol Bay, but are the spawning grounds of five species of salmon, the loss of which would have huge landscape scale implications for the ecosystems of the Northwest USA, USA and the Alaskan Peninsula. Key biodiversity areas for migratory birds, marine fish and mammals, bears and the great Alaskan herds of caribou, notwithstanding the huge dependency of the fisheries, uh, on these fisheries for the First Nations people and local commercial fishermen. Realizing the sensitivity of this project and risks involved, with our help, Anglo has divested from the project, as has Rio Tinto, a very good outcome in terms of the influence FFI has over the decision-making of a company and their strategic approach to their assets. It's not always as simple as that. And sometimes our interventions take many years before any positive result is seen. And often it involves working with a multitude of stakeholders across very different sectors. One such story continues to unfold in Namibia. My love affair with Namibia started about 10 years ago and it was in the Namib Naukluf National Park, an area designated to protect the world's oldest at 60 million years and probably the most biodiverse e a desert ecosystem in the world. From oryx to elephant, scolopendromorphs to tenebrinid beetles, the wildlife in this region is intoxicating. So it's very vulnerable. During my first visit to Namib Namibia, I was shocked to find that the Namib desert was pockmarked with drilling rigs operating in the Namib Nalkov National Park and within an area designated as a proposed World Heritage Site. What on earth was happening? No one could answer my questions, but I did manage to speak to across a number of very different um, um, individuals and organizations and a very receptive government and the stakeholders from mining and tourism and farming as well. How? I was asked by the director of the Geological Survey in the Ministry of Mines and Energy could they say no to foreign direct investment when they were trying to reduce poverty or increase the rate of economic development and the economic status of Namibia? How, when a foreign investor had found a viable mineral deposit that would generate desperately needed foreign re revenue for the country, could they say no, purely on the grounds of environmental sensitivity? And the government was actually sued for saying no on one account, so it was actually quite hard for them to, 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 to make that sort of decision. Well, you and I know that, uh, the, what the answer could have been. But even with the arguments about short-term gains of mining versus long-term sustainability of alternative livelihoods such as ecotourism and the need to maintain unique biodiversity in this remarkable desert ecosystem, we reached a stalemate. 
And then we produced a bit of a trump card, something that the Ministry of Mines and Energy really couldn't say no to because some of the biggest mining companies in the world had agreed to it. So here it is. The International Council for Mining and Metals, and John, nice to see you here, you've been involved in this, but has declared a no-go to mining in World Heritage Sites. All its 32 members have signed up to this, something that FFI and other conservation NGOs helped to formulate with them through the leverage we have with our uh, strategic partnership, uh, partner companies such as, as Rio Tinto, Anglo American, Newmont, and BHP Billiton. They've made that decision. So whilst Namibia felt it could not say no to, uh, sorry, that it could yeah, not say no to proposed um, mines in areas that it already said yes to, it could declare new World Heritage designations and create a policy argument to refuse new mine development. A rather clever and somewhat circuitous route, I'm sure you'll agree, to actually doing the right thing. So our intervention and the work that we did with the Ministry of Mines and Energy really came to this point, the declaration of the world's newest and one of the largest World Heritage sites. It's 3.9 million hectares and the Namibian government is able to say no to any type of exploration and mining activity there. So that's a really, really amazing outcome. Now turning our, from our addiction um, to, to minerals from mining to hydrocarbons, plastics, widgets, packaging, fuel, the case on your phone, I'd like to take you into the marine environment and then back again to our gorillas. The mining and energy team are busy with three fantastic marine conservation programs advising two, two global oil and gas producers. I'm first and foremost a marine ecologist. Spending most of my undergraduate years at Cape Town with cold water corals, kelp beds, jackass penguins, sea lions, and uh, un unintentionally with a couple of great white sharks. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> The first project takes us to the wild, hyper-arid regions of the northwestern, no, sorry, northeastern corner of the Colombian Caribbean. Hugely important for marine mammals and sea turtles, home to the Wayu people and indigenous people that are hugely dependent on marine ecosystems for food and livelihoods. How can we ensure that the gas field development that's going to happen over 40, 50 kilometers offshore, does not compete with the local people's needs and rights and certainly does not impact the incredible marine bio biodiversity. So this is where our technical analysis comes in. We've depleted, so we've developed our methodologies to assess the values and the way that the people in the communities depend on the environment and the way that the company depends on its environment. And we've developed a strategy for the company that will ensure that there is minimal conflict between them and the local communities. And this methodology is going to be integrated into government guidance as best practice. Now, one of the species that we're particularly concerned about when it comes to marine oil and gas developments are sea turtles. Ancient creatures with global distributions, the five main sea turtle species are highly threatened and in many cases endangered throughout their distribution. They have complex life histories spending many decades of their lives out in deep oceans before they're ready to breed. When they do reach sexual maturity, sea turtles tend to return to the same beaches where they were born, but it can take 30 to 50 years for an adult to reach that age, that, that point of sexual maturity. So what happens when a sea turtle tur returns to its natal beach only to find a large oil and gas refinery plonked on top of its natal beach? or finds pipelines and port infrastructure in the way of its mating grounds, or vessels patrolling running, and running logistics in the bay where it feeds. How does, an oil, oil, how does the oil and gas sector take these questions seriously? They really haven't done an adequate job to date. So this is where we try to ha tackle this issue head on. So FFI is working hard on this question. We've tapped our global project portfolio and drawn on the expertise of our turtle projects across the world. We're also working with the IUCN's Turtle Specialist Group. And with the support of Arcadia funding, we've developed a good practice guidance for, the, for managing marine biodiversity for the oil and gas sector. I launched that at the IUCN World Con uh, Conservation Congress in, in Hawaii last week. We've challenged the World Bank, too, about their approach to sea turtles. And they finally agreed that sea turtles need special attention. 
and projects funded by the World Bank in areas where sea turtles are found will need to invest significantly in reversing the decline um, of the, these remarkable species. This means supporting beach patrols, hatcheries, research efforts, anti-poaching efforts, or developing education programs and awareness for, for, uh, for the communities around the important role that turtles play in the ecosystem, such as controlling jellyfish and maintaining seagrass habitat. Finally, returning to gorillas and the highly threatened landscapes I started off with, FFI is working with a number of other NGOs to keep oil and gas companies out of the Virunga's National World Heritage Site, where the temptation to sacrifice mountain gorillas' habitat for oil and gas exploitation is a very real threat in the DRC, in Uganda and Rwanda. And we succeeded in stopping SOCO with a number of other NGOs, of course. SOCO is a, is a British um, oil and gas company. Um, from, from entering and, and developing a, um, concessions in, in the Virungas. And this was done with a joint statement, which has also convinced a number of other multinationals to stay away. A really big win. We're doing the same for Lake Edward, for the <coughs> central Congo Basin, and for the Kaudum Iron Ore Reserve area. We're standing strong to get the oil and gas sector, mining companies and governments to prevent exploitation of these sorts of areas. Not only World Heritage Sites, though, we're taking this even further to ensure that strict principles are applied to the protection of biodiversity across the globe. Large iconic species like gorillas and the small nuts and bolts of our ecosystem that we don't always notice, really across into any key biodiversity area and beyond. We also need to take care of the <laughs> infrastructure. Of course, all of this stuff has to get from A to B, and concrete and cement, the power lines that traverse the landscapes are really important to deal with too. Concrete is diffuse, has all the roads and the networks that put these together, but this is actually the subject of Tony's talk. So without further, uh, further ado, I'm going to introduce Dr. Tony Witten, FFI's Asia Pacific Director, uh, who's a champion of the nuts and bolts of ecology, from gibbons actually, to ducks and freshwater fish Tony somehow found himself uh, as vice chair of the cave specialist group with uh, IUCN. Tony, over to you. Good evening. Um, I want to bring to center stage that that's cement, I guess you recognized it. It's like the ugly duckling of the mineral world. The coltans, the gold, the copper, the uranium are sexy things. This is concrete. You can get a bag like this in B&Q for about five pounds, six pounds, 25p per kilo. There is nothing attractive about cement. Um, as you know, it's a, it's a fine gray powdery substance um, made from um, getting um, ca calcium carbonate, limestone, think white cliffs of Dover, grinding it up, heating it to about one and a half thousand degrees um, with clay, and you get this product. Um, and then if you wet it and mix it with sand or gravel, it becomes concrete. And concrete is what those cooling towers are made of, and you may not know, I certainly didn't, uh, it doesn't say much, but um, that, that the concrete is the second most consumed substance on earth. The first is water, the second is concrete, and for every man, woman, and child, woman, man, and child on earth, um, three tons of concrete are consumed every year. So concrete is really important, and I don't know if cement companies were invited to our me meeting back in 1999, but it is the cin Cinderella of the minerals world. What a lot of people don't know, but you after this will know, is that limestone landscapes like this in South China harbor amazing biodiversity. Um, it has a lot of species that have small ranges. And when I say small, small, I mean really, really small. Smaller than you can possibly imagine. Um, as you can see, a lot of the hills 
um, occur in these landscapes now with um, agricultural land between them, and they're like islands in an ocean. Think Galapagos. That's why there's so many species that are found here and nowhere else, and why they have these small ranges. These water-eroded land landscapes are known as karst, um, and there's biodiversity interest not just on the hills, but inside them, in the caves that you find inside. There are times when I talk about limestone um, that I wish we had tigers there as the flagship species. You know, save the tiger and you'll save all the other little species that share the habitat. But it doesn't work like that. You don't get tigers on those sorts of hills. There are some beautiful plants. Um, that's a cycad up there, slipper orchid, a uh, pretty um, blue jes jesneriad herb and begonias. Now, begonias you find on limestone hills a lot, and they're great on there, because if you think of that limestone cliff I showed you just now, it's bare rock. There's very little soil on limestone hills. And so when it's dry, um, these begonias shrivel up. And you've seen that. You've seen the windowsill in your kitchen, and you come back from holiday, and you realize that you didn't water the plants before you left. But then, then you water them again, and they resuscitate. They come back to life. And so a lot of plants on limestone hills have that same ability. Now, in the caves, we don't have tigers, but we have big, scary, mean-looking top predators. And here's a whip spider. It looks pretty big. It's actually about, I don't know, three, two, two and a half, three inches across. Um, but the antennae go on for about half a meter. Um, and that's the most fearsome thing. That they are really, you, or when you catch them, you really have to want to catch them, because otherwise you just stop at the last minute, uh, if you want to catch them. Um, so deep in the darker caves, it's really humid. It's actually really unpleasant. Um, and there's no light, and so nothing really has any color. Nothing has any pattern. Um, there's no waterproof cuticle on animals. Um, there's no wings on, on, on the animals there um, because they have no purpose. It's dark. There's no point having a pattern because no one can see it. Um, so what you find is things like blind white millipedes, um, long-leggedy blind and flightless beetles, and pinkish fish creeping on the walls because it's so humid they don't actually need to be in the water. And they live there in an ecosystem which is largely driven by feces um, raining from the roof from bats and some of the birds that manage to live in caves. It's a poop system. Delightful. Um, amongst the... But bats, you know, you may not... It's a fruit bat. There, there are some really weird-looking bats, but they all have their own particular beauty. Um, amongst the animals that you find both... Um, in, in abundance on the outside of limestone hills and in some of the caves inside are the snails and slugs, the gastropods, as in the program. Gastropod, stomach foot, because that's what it looks like. It looks like a foot stomach, sort of. Um, and um, there are some with tiger stripes, but it's, it's, and even I would admit, it's not quite the same thing as the mammal version. Now, FFI has long been known as the champion um, of the underdog, uh, of the unloved of the biodiversity world. And it was in the early 80s that FFPS, as it was back then, um, started the Help a Toad Across the Road campaign. Um, that's 30 years ago. And we're very flattered by all those that have sort of come along in our wake. Um, uh, we've we, we've um, helped the snakes that uh, were sh shown, shown earlier uh, in the Caribbean, um, and we started Bat Conservation International to give uh, uh, attention to, a, at that stage, a very unloved group. Snails and slugs get a bad rap, um, and I'm sure that you've, you may not admit it, but you've either stamped on one in the allotment or garden, or at least you've thrown it into the, the next door garden. <laughs> I see you shaking your head. I don't believe it for a minute. Um, but they, did, they deserve um, a higher profile. And so now, 
here in the Babbage Lecture Theatre for the first time in 113 years of history of Fauna and Flora International. It's a presentation largely focused on gastropods. It's about time. Now, although there are, of course, marine snails and there's freshwater snails, the things that I'm going to be showing are all terrestrial. And I want to start talking about these snails through a case study from Malaysia, West Malaysia, a hill called Kantan. Single hill used to be about 130 hectares, just 1.3 square kilometers. And about 50, year, about 50 years ago, um, this was started to be um, used as a cement quarry, and various co companies have been there um, turning this hill into cement. And it's now owned by Lafarge, Malaysia. Um, Lafarge overall is a decent company, overall. I'll come back to that. Um, and so what has happened is that that's been reduced from 130 hectares to now about 60 hectares of forested slopes. Now, Lafarge has its headquarters in Paris, um, and it used to be a, a pretty major producer of cement, and it's now even larger because it's merged with a company based in Zurich called Holcim, and it's now called together, um, rather unimaginatively, Lafarge Holcim. So, um, now, FFI used to sit on the panel, um, on in, um, the, the International Panel on Biodiversity for Lafarge, and we would go over to Paris and, and, and talk. I did this with Pippa. And we resigned about four years ago because we just felt that we were wasting our time. Our recommendations that we thought were good um, and our concerns were serially ignored by the company. Um, we weren't allowed the same sort of dialogue um, as Pippa was describing with the, uh, the, the various companies just now. And we just felt that we were being used. We were part of the company Greenwash. And so we told them that we felt that we could actually do more outside their international pan panel on biodiversity than we could inside it. Now, just before we resigned, uh, we became aware of this creature, which is, in, which is an amazing spider. Now, it's only known from a cave at the southern end of that hill. Its total global range is 0 0.003 square kilometers. So it's a pretty small range, not found anywhere else. There are other hills and there are other species, but this one has only ever been found on this hill. Now, I said it was amazing, and I expect some, some of you noticed that it's got a segmented abdomen. And what I wanted was gasps of, God. Okay, it's got a segmented abdomen. Thank you. So what this means is that this sort of harks back to some long extinct um, arthropod ancestor. Fossils of this little creature have been found from about 300 million years ago, looking pretty much the same as far as you can tell from a squashed fossil. Um, and of the 46,000 roughly species of spider, some may think that's far too many, um, there's only about 100 with an abdomen like that. Now, this little creature lives in burrows in the sides of um, caves, and at the end of the burrow is a trap door. And out of the trap door come little silk threads, and when a cricket comes along and trips along um, a, a thread, this spider comes out of the, the burrow, grabs a cricket, and goes back inside. And that's, that's life for one of these things. It's not, it's not that exciting, but I find it very hard to criticize because it's been around for 300 million years, and we haven't. Um, so, um, so we told Lafarge about this, and, and they were completely unmoved. It's a spider, you know, come on, give me a break. So then what we did was we um, assessed it for the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species. And we found by doing that, unsurprisingly, for a snail next to a limestone quarry with a global range of 0.003 square kilometers, that it was critically endangered. Now, 
the company did take notice because the company did have policies on the environment and on biodiversity, which basically said they're going to cuddle it, and it was great, and that they were doing lots of things with orchids and stuff. Um, but um, they did agree to leave that cave section and a small buffer zone alone, and they weren't going to quarry it. So that's really good. So sort of two cheers for Lafarge. I take a cheer off that because if you think of a cave, and it's a big cave, um, the, bless you, um, if you don't quarry that, what you're not quarrying is a heck of a lot of air, and there's not that much limestone because it's a cave. So <laughs> hence the two cheers for Lafarge. Um, now, um, shortly after that, um, someone found this new species of cave-adapted gecko. Its eye is slightly larger than the ones that don't live in caves. And then we had some gorilla surveys. Now, you may say gorillas don't occur in West Malaysia. Well, this is, uh, these are gorilla with a G-U-E-R. So there were gorilla surveys done by a team of botanists, and they found one large tree, one medium to small tree, and a pretty blue herb that were found that seemed, seemed to be endemic on this hill. And the, the limestone flora of um, West Malaysia is known pretty well, and, and they were good botanists. So that's now uh, one, two, three, four, five species restricted to this little hill. Um, and of course, there's two species of snail, that's seven species, um, and all within that 60 hectares. Now, some of you may be thinking quietly to yourself, um, <sighs> extinction's a natural process, right? So cup of spider or a spider or a gecko, so, so what? But the, the rate of extinction is so much faster now. It's orders of magnitude greater than the background rate of extinction. And what, what riles me in working with cement companies, with some, um, is that they are actually knowingly, deliberately causing things to go extinct by taking no action. I get quite emotional about that. Um, so anyway, these species, those seven species are known from the southern bit of the hill. So they thought, well, if, you know, perhaps we can do something in the south. And then some colleagues uh, were doing some snail surveys up at the very north, and they found a new species of snail. Now, big snail. No, it's not. Um, <laughs> down here, it says, it's 1.4 millimeters tall. What do you do to get attention to a snail that is, appears to be endemic to their hill? What you do, you name it after them. So I would like to introduce you to Chiropa lafargei. Um, <laughs> and um, Lafarge was not, mm, was not amused, shall we say. Um, so there's going to be some pictures of snails just to broaden your experience of snails if all you really know about snails are the ones you get in your allotment and garden. Now, I've got to point out that, that we are not, well, we are emphatically not anti-cement. Um, we're not going to start a campaign against cement. Um, we're not advocating a return to wattle and daub. Um, we are simply pro-planning, pro-good science, pro-dialogue, um, pro-good good consultation. We've written guidance to help um, companies and governments um, to, to see how they can reduce the risk of extinctions. For example, it's far, far better to nibble away at the side of a large area of limestone than it is to just destroy um, a hill. I'm very pleased to say that Lafarge Malaysia has finally got it, and it's changed ma management there, and they are now far more responsive. It's commissioned a proper snail survey of both the hill and the small hills around it in order to get some context. They don't have to do gorilla surveys anymore. They are officially going to invite the botanists back to do more, more survey work. We're going to be helping them with a, um, a bi biodiversity management plan. And they're also going to be doing a subsurface geology study. Now, the significance of that is that if they find that the limestone is relatively shallow, and relatively abundant, what they're going to do is dig a huge pit within the concession below what they've already quarried. And if that limestone is sufficiently abundant, they won't have to take the remaining forested slopes. And we're on the edge of, um, or about six, seven months away, 
uh, once we know the result of that study, of going to local government and national government, because there are going to have to be policy ch changes in Malaysia, of having a cement company with an international NGO, with a local NGO, um, with um, some academics singing from the, 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 the same hymn sheet. Um, we're going to be in unison, together, arm in arm. It's just the, the perfect dream um, in conservation. Uh, me meanwhile, in um, the headquarters of Lafarge Holcim in, uh, or outside Zurich, the lead person on biodiversity has changed and is now really engaged and we're starting to work with them on cement sites in Indonesia, Vietnam, Philippines, and possibly southeast Nigeria. Um, time doesn't allow me to tell you about the exciting things we're doing in, um, with, with the Burmese government and with state-owned and pr private cement companies uh, in Myanmar, uh, but you know, they're knocking on our door and we can't respond fast enough um, to their request to do things to help them manage limestone resources in a proper way to, to save biodiversity. And in a few months' time, we will be co-producing the first ever field guide to the snails of Myanmar. Thank you. So order your copy soon, see, see me later. And also, um, there's no time to tell you about the, the possibility of an arrangement with uh, a company that has made a major discovery, which is how to make cement from carbon dioxide and water, and in a way that doesn't require a kiln going at 1,500 degrees 24-7. They're taking the lead from coral polyps and from snails, who start out as squishy soft things and make calcium carbonate. They make cement. So, um, the reason I mention this is that you may not know, amazingly, eh? um, you, you may not know that the cement sector accounts for 5% of global carbon dioxide emissions because it heats cal calcium carbonate, so it releases cal um, ca ca carbon dioxide during the kiln process. Um, and it also it needs a lot of things to combust to... Uh, get, get to those high temperatures. Um, there are ways to get carbon dioxide absorbed into concrete one, once it's been formed, um, but that's in, in early days, and that's only a partial solution. This company in California actually makes the production of cement carbon negative, which would be a huge contribution. So, so maybe in this major game player, snails are going to save the world, <laughs> which would be really neat. Now, here at FFI, we care about both the big and the small. We can't just give attention to the big charismatic mammals, the tigers, elephants, rhinos, and stuff that we're justly well known for. Um, and indeed, in the, uh, the current FFI business plan, um, it says that we're going to be securing karst landscapes in, uh, in Asia. And, and that's Part, part of, or, or one of the 12 signature actions, as we call them. And I'm, ho I'm hoping to get a, a, another member of staff who can take on the work full time. Now, gastropods are actually more charismatic than you think or thought. You've seen that there's some gorgeous things. Look at that. Um, but also, no, no, okay. Um, but there's also predatory snails. Think of a, you know, a mucus-covered snail being a predator. A horrific nightmares you'll have tonight. There, there are jumping snails. There are singing snails. There are hairy snails. There are a few up there earlier. And, and there's one species in Southeast Asia, even in the streets of Singapore, that glows in the dark. How cool is that? The, the only land mollusk to, to glow in the dark. So they're small, and yeah, they're mucus-covered, but in their own sweet way, they're just as important as gorillas. Snails may be at somewhat of an opposite end uh, of the charisma spectrum from gorillas, but the line that connects them to gorillas is actually a continuum. And what we face is the decision of you know, where along that do we say, ah, we don't bother anymore. Um, if we don't value snails in some ways, and other creepy, crawly things. What species do we decide to 
to, to be un unworthy of our attention. It's a philosophical and moral question, and there's wine upstairs so we can discuss that. <laughs> now, FFI is essentially alone in this limestone space, and there's plenty of room to grow it if we had the means of doing so, because there's so many species on their last legs, or stomach, foot. Um, if you're a millipede, the last leg is really serious because you <laughs> can't move much. Um, now, you may have seen this news story, Bugs of Distinction on the Brink of Extinction. Good headline writers we have. Um, now, um, we found that in these hills down the south end of Vietnam, we, we found the world's um, greatest, uh, the, the, the place in the world that has the most threatened species. Now, sure, some of them are, or, or most of them are snails and other small things, but those 33 species that we assessed are in imminent danger of extinction because of cement companies um, continuing as though they didn't have anything there of value. So I'm going to announce tonight a really special opportunity. This thing here, the snail there, the soft parts are not yet known. Um, it's called the ghost snail, or we call it the ghost snail. Um, it's found in caves, but also on the outside. It's not just a new species, it's a new genus with probably two or three species within it. Now, the ghost snail is currently endangered. Uh, it's been put on the IUCN red list. The name up there with periomphalic furrow um, is just a holding name, and it's like Cyclophorus, but it's not Cyclophorus. Um, it's a new species, and the, the, um, it's known from parts of two of the area's 17 hills, where the combined habitat for this snail is between 15 and 20 hectares. Now, one of the hills is currently degraded, but it's protected by the fencing off of an explosive storage area. Funny way to protect a species, but it is. And the other hill is slightly better shape, um, but could well become a cement quarry when the neighboring hills have been raised to the ground. Both of the sites are within a concession uh, of a cement quarry. And we're joining with IUCN to work with the local government there to try to, make, to help them make some rational choices about what to do with these hills. So what we're doing, we're looking for some generous people who would like to support our work on limestone restricted biodiversity. We're looking for pledges to help that work. And for the highest pledge, we would like to show our thanks by giving the opportunity for that person to work with the taxonomist who's writing the formal description of this genus. Um, and to um, the, the person with the, high, the highest pledge will help to name the thing in perpetuity. Um, now, for example, the name might be based on a loved one with a correct Greek or Latin formulation. Uh, it could be the name of someone that that snail reminds you of. Um, it could be uh, the name of uh, your favorite fictional ghost character. Um, or it may be for someone that you admire, as, as was done for a five meter long Jurassic pleosaur uh, found in Dorset, which is now known as Attenboroughsaurus. Um, we believe that this is the first time um, that an opportunity to help name a genus will have been made available for the purposes of conservation. For lesser pledges, but still welcome, um, we'll give the opportunity to, again, work, work with the taxonomist to help name the species, to give the species names. If you're interested, you'll find a sign-up sheet at reception as you go up to uh, the reception. Um, so please do that. We'll then get in touch with you. This opportunity is going to last until, until sort of the end of the year. Um, and it really could be a gift of a lifetime. And if I could just remind you, there's only 102 days until Christmas. Thank you very much.